Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 400, 400 of the Agostino Zynga Show. How you guys doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm not going to lie, bro. I'm feeling pretty good. As you can tell, I've got no glasses on to mark this special occasion, right? Special milestone in my podcast life story, right? 400 episodes. But guess what I forgot to bring with me when I was recording? Bloody glasses, as per usual. But we're still in the spot. We're still in the sector. We're still throwing up signs and all that malarkey, doing all that stuff to make ourselves look a bit tough. But I hope wherever you are, you're feeling good and you're feeling fine. But God damn it, man. Imagine. 400 episodes 400 who would have guessed it when i started off you know doing my thing and all the haters out there were saying agostino you're never gonna make it you're just a fly for what's that a, a flash in a pan you don't have the chops to do it you were brought up in a really bad neighborhood la, la. No, no i actually said that right that's part of my story that i invent but let's just play along with the story just imagine there's these scores of haters writing on forums ah oh, he took so much rubbish how come he got a show who listens to that bullshit but guess what you guys do you tune in week after week and i can't be more thankful more thankful for it so as a toast to you, I'm drinking a nondescript drink out of this really crazy, cheap plastic cup. Cheers to you guys for tuning in every single week, supporting the show via Patreon, supporting the show via YouTube, supporting the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find this thing. God bless you and thank you for your presence. I'm happy to see you. I sound like an auntie or some sort of uncle. Whatever it is, I'm more than chuffed, more than appreciative of it. And I'm just sending this message as heartfelt as I can to you trying to connect via the airwaves and i'm hoping that you can feel the emotion in my heart cool but aside from that oh actually let's drink actually toast right? toast thank you for 400 um aside from that yeah just we just keep on trucking on in it no big fanfare no big hullabalooza it is what it is this is something i want to do for the rest of my life because i really enjoy I'm getting out all these minute thoughts that I have floating around in my head and communicating with you lovely people on the interweb. So why not keep doing this thing, record it every week, you know, just keep the consistency going on and keep driving, driving, driving. To mark this special 400 episode, actually, I just wanted to, a quick announcement. If you're not already, make sure you sign up to my Patreon. It's patreon.com for just Agostino patreon.com for us agostino a-g-o-s-t-a-n-h-o sign up on there because from this week onwards i'm going to be producing one free or well, one bonus podcast episode only for patreon so make sure you tune in there it's going to be called what do i know it's going to be you know loads of things that i don't know about and i'm going to be speaking about on the patreon show so make sure you check that out what do i know on the pod on the patreon um site my patreon page story patreon.com for us agostino Sign up on there for little as one dollar. It only costs you one dollar or the equivalent of one pound to sign up via Patreon. You can sign up on there, get access to my entire library, as well as that show called What Do I Know with Agostino on Patreon. So make sure you check that out. What do I know with Agostino will be featured on Patreon once per week from this week going on. So if you want to unlock that, it's only going to be available on Patreon, it won't be available anywhere else. Check that out there on patreon.com for just Agostino, patreon.com for just A G O S T I N H O. You'll see that on there. Get involved, get cracker lacking. And of course, if you're watching via YouTube, smash that like, smash that subscribe. Um, leave me a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on it. Communicate with the kids, share the videos, you know. You know the vibes. You know the vibes. You know the vibes, man. Let's just keep it going, keep it trucking. But yeah, um, here we are. Here we are. Another week, um, another week of um lockdown, another week of restrictions, another week of not doing what we what hell we want to do. But we're all used to it now, and I don't think anyone's um shocked or appalled by a position that we're in anymore. We've gone we've kind of reached that stage now where what we're doing is what we're doing until we get told any different. Um you know, it's, it's starting to get boring even talking about COVID, right? Talking about solutions or talking about the missteps of the government. Because what can we actually do? How, what can we actually impact? Nothing. Spiritful for somebody, forget what's happening in Belarus. Forget what's happening in Poland. Imagine if you if you live in America and you have this idea that somehow you live in a first world country, right? You live in a democratic country and you've elected somebody or, you know, you've cast your ballot, you put your vote in. You get told all the votes have been counted or, or the election or the voting cycle has been closed. You can't vote any longer, but you still have no idea who your leader is. You don't have no idea who your president is. No idea. And you're not going to have any idea until maybe the new year. Imagine how that must feel. So on top of not knowing what you're going to do with your future, with, with you know living in a COVID world, you have no idea who's going to be the leading in the nation going forward from the new year. 
absolutely insane. So I don't know. Sometimes I I don't I don't say I lose hope, but I do get a little bit disconsolate about talking about these things because it just seems like you're just repeating the same old talking points. We all seem to have the best ideas. All of us that are sitting back at home in our armchairs, folding our arms, right, um, eating our flipping Pringles, we seem to have all the answers for some reason. But the people that are actually paid to concentrate about, imagine you get paid because I always this is maybe because I come from the employment world for most of my adult life, right? I is like most of my creative hobbies I've been doing on the side have just been side hobbies. Maybe I've not been brave enough. Maybe I hadn't had the, the uh, chance to do them full time, regardless of what it is. Most of my life has come from working nine to five right in various different industries usually more likely than not right and this is only my experience more often than not in the places i've worked the people that have got furthest the people that have kind of achieved the most the people that have been able to climb up the ranks right get all the promotions have usually usually been the people who have been the most diligent the most hard working the most committed they give that extra 10 5 15 percent right every day when they come into work but you can tell that they spend every single minute of the day concentrating on what they're doing focusing deep work um for an, an aim of getting to a certain spot right whether it's monetarily whether it's an occupation but there is a there is a single-mindedness kind of attitude that kind of dave's people have that it makes you think you know what when that person gets a promotion you're not all kind of you know i'm not all kind of when you're back chatting or kind of gossiping with your friends in your team you're not saying that person doesn't deserve it you're giving them props but you're also admitting hey i don't have what that person has because i just turn up and just do my job right it's not the best attitude to have but for the most part most of us in employment just show up we do our job and we go home but there are the select few of people out there that do exist who are committed to your work like it's a vocation and in my naive head i always assume people in politics had that right i'd imagine working in in you know in um working in healthcare would have someone like that working working as a police officer as a fire you know whatever in a fire brigade there'd be something that would it would it seems more like a calling then i'm going to do that as a job to pay the bills i would assume those kind of roles so when i so when you're doing them so when that person is yeah, when a person's doing it, I just expect a certain level of expertise that's going to be out of reach for you and I. But when you and I have the answers, when you and I know exactly what should be done or what looks like a bad idea, and these people don't, it's a bit concerning. You're like, how do I know this? And I'm an absolute dunce, right? I'm an idiot, right? Just about flipping got my GCSEs, just about got my A-levels, just about got my degree. How do I know this, right? Yet these people who have committed their entire livelihood to become a politician get into a position where I would say this from the beginning, right? I think this is the one time where you actually get to prove, not prove, well, you get to prove, you get to illustrate your, you know, your skill level, right? When there's a crisis, when there's a moment where you're actually, you know, your policies and your action plan and your, you know, recovery package, support package, whatever it may be, this is the time when people are actually paying attention. Regular folk, right? They're looking at everything and what's doing. This is the time you get to actually show off. Like, how in how in innovative are you, right? Um, how are you able to kind of make the best out of a bad situation? Whatever it may be. And everyone, for the most part, is flipping, failing. There's Fs everywhere. F, 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 F. It doesn't seem to be getting any better. That's the real concerning part about it. It doesn't seem to be getting any better. Week on week, we have more information. We have more data. We have, unfortunately, more deaths, more cases. So you'd assume there'd be more reference points to kind of pull from for us to, for it to inform the next decision cycle. But so far now, nah. so far, it just seems like everyone's doing lockdowns, rinse and repeating, opening up again, numbers spike up, do a lockdown again, close everything, don't support pe don't support um, industries. Then when they complain, make them sound like they're flipping psychos, then go back to the drawing board. It's just like a round, around, around, around the robin. And I don't know, man, I'm just a bit, I'm just a bit bored of it, man. Just a bit bored of it it man really am i just wanted to get back to normal but you know probably not going to get back to normal for any way shape or form i was always resigned to the idea that this year was a wrap anyway which already it is but i was already resigned to the idea that next summer would be a wrap too i said my optimistic goal was that and i said this in march i'm not gonna no i'm not gonna miss a note all but i was assuming in march when everyone's locking down there's no way a government can lock things down and reopen them within a space of a year it's just not gonna happen we don't have the functionality to do that right and there's too many busybodies in the government to like, oh, we're too afraid of this or that, or whatever, right? So I was always under the assumption that the most optimistic goal for us to get back to normal, when I mean normal, I mean whatever you were doing this time 2019, right? So November 2019, what were you doing on this day, right? Whatever day it is. Um, the earliest you could do that, I was saying, would be April of next year. 
uh, earliest. That was my earliest, right? April 2020. But my optimistic goal in mind will probably be October. That's what I was saying. So it'd probably be like a good 18 months of us being under some sort of restrictions before we get back to any kind of normality. And, and at that time, everyone was still under the assumption that they were going to have a summer holiday. Some people did. Some people went on holidays. Congratulations to you as well. If you managed to slip away and get up and have a little bit of time to enjoy yourself, then congrats. I wish I did that. I wish I didn't just lock in place and... I was so worried, especially in the beginning, about going anywhere. But I wish I was a bit cheeky and did some sort of holiday trip just so I could have had something to sort of like say, I look back on and say, oh, I did this thing because this year has been a wrap. But, you know, small consolation is that everyone's been in the shit. So, you know, it's no, um, I'm no exception in that regard. But this was, I said this when everyone was thinking we're going to have a summer holiday, when everyone was thinking they were going to have, you know, um, all these public holidays would be exactly like the same. You're going to go back to the club. You're going to go do this, go do that. I'm just thinking, nah, man, it's unlikely, man. When governments shut things down like this, it, it doesn't just reopen easily. It's, it takes time, um, checks and balances, blah, 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 blah. And considering, and I guess the only good thing to look forward to now is that because there's a vaccine, it might expedite some things. So they might be like, you know what, we've got a vaccine coming up. So the best that we can do to kind of look, not look after ourselves, but the best thing that we can do to help the situation would be to obviously to increase testing, you know, um, you know, safeguards, help some different industries and whatever it may be. But there's, there, there is a way to do it um, in the interim that will help things along so that people can get back to some level of normality. Life can reopen um, or businesses can reopen for the most part. Because just imagine you know, all this little mom and pop stores that have been suffering throughout COVID. So, yeah, that's kind of been my reckoning at the moment. But, hey, man, what can you do, really, isn't it? What can we do? We are where we are. It is what it is. And we just have to continue on as it is. Anyway. Many things to get in into, loads of things to delve into that I want to talk about. Um, so grab yourself a drink, whatever it is you're drinking, something to nibble on, and let's get in on the show. Okay, number one, uh, we got this really funny story in my head. I think it's super hilarious. The UK government is considering allowing us UK residents the ability to celebrate Christmas, right, in the midst of a lockdown. What could go wrong, right? What could go wrong? They spent all this time telling us, oh, if you stay indoors with people you don't know in mixed groups, outside a support bubble, you're going to spread the virus, you're going to kill grandma, you're going to spread it all over the place, blah, 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 blah. And now they're somehow figuring out a way to open things up so that it can allow us to go to other people's homes to celebrate Christmas. I'm not sure about you, but I could give a shit about Christmas anyway, regularly, right? Couldn't care less could care one less right christmas birthdays don't give a crap right i'm a grown-up right i don't celebrate these things unless you're unless you're under 10 it doesn't matter really it really doesn't you're you're amongst friends you're amongst family cool eat drink go and do your thing but in terms of oh i can't wait for christmas or my birthday grow up if you're over 10 grow up right and especially in this year especially this year wouldn't this be the year where like you'd be like you know what i know usually i make a big deal at christmas but this is the one year where i'm gonna try and scale it back a bit and guess what not go to other people's homes maybe just do something over skype maybe make something i don't know connect with your people um some other way you know facetime make some bang dinner at home with people that you live with wherever it may be or if you don't live with somebody i don't know watch a flipping podcast wouldn't that be a better time to wouldn't this be the perfect time to be like you know what i'm gonna rein it in and this is what I don't understand about this year. Like, why is it this year, in the midst of COVID, everyone wants to celebrate their birthday. They want to celebrate their um, gender reveals, celebrate their engagements, all these celebrations in the midst of a global pandemic. And usually, for the most part, if you're a celebrator of things, you're not celebrating them alone. You're always celebrating them in groups, right? When have you ever seen P. Diddy partying by himself? He's not like you and I. He doesn't, he doesn't go to flipping Berghain, queue up for an hour and a half on his own, and then rave for 15 hours by himself. He doesn't do that. He's always on a boat surrounded by lovelies, right? Surrounded by baddies and the boys, right? So if you're a celebrator of, your, if you're a celebrator of these flipping personal holidays and all these sh shenanigans, you're going to have strangers around you. So that kind of defeats the purpose of being under lockdown, doesn't it? Doesn't it defeat the purpose? Tell me. Tell me that to be the purpose. I think it does. What an absolute shocker anyway. So this is the news via BBC. COVID-19, family Christmas get-togethers being considered. Like, does make it make sense? So it continues here. Nice to see a black family featured on, the, on one of the pictures. Nice little touch there, right? 
Uh, <laughs> ministers are looking at how to relax coronavirus restrictions so families can celebrate Christmas together. The government's medical advisor on COVID, Susan Hopkins, said they were working on the plan and wanted Christmas to be as normal as possible. How can it be normal during COVID? Please, someone tell me. How? How can it be normal? It's impossible. She said um, tough restrictions might be needed before and after the holiday to allow mixing to take place. Which means, if you really want to do, if you really want to do Christmas, right? This is what I have to do. Same with people that went on holiday. If you went on holiday and you were one of these dunces that went on holiday during the summer and then complained that you had to be under quarantine, you deserve to be pushed off a bridge somewhere, right? If you're going to go on holiday, accept the risk and also accept the responsibility that when you come back, you have to go under quarantine for 14 days. It's a bit arbitrary. It's a bit annoying. Is it really, why, what's the difference between 10 days and 14 days? We don't know, but just, you know, obey the science for now and just do the 14 days and you can go, right? So you'd have to do these little 14 day increments. So you'd have to get tested, I guess, the first day and the 14th day before you leave a holiday. Then when you come back, you get tested and you get, I don't know, whatever you do, but you'd make it work. It's a bit annoying, but you could do it. Same with this Christmas thing. If you really want to go celebrate Christmas with your family and friends, just quarantine for 14 days before the 25th or whatever it is when you go celebrate. And then you could go over to your family, celebrate, hug, kiss, hang out as much as you want, and there'd be absolutely no issue. But no one wants to do that. Everyone wants everything, but no sacrifices. And the government are doing the same thing to us. Like, it's just, it's insane. It's insane. They're treating us like absolute babies. Um, maybe we are babies. Is that it? Maybe we are. <laughs> Um, she said da, da, da. BBC health correspondent Nick Triggy said any rule could change would be a limited time maybe just a few days that is nuts that is nuts and legitimately please tell me what the difference is between them saying hey we know a lot of you know if you've ever been in a workplace you'd know that the months between August and December seem to be everyone's birthday every other week or mostly every week at your office space somebody's bringing some cake muffins whatever bullshit people um, order whenever they do their birthdays as you can tell I'm not a fan of birthdays get sodded if you're over 10 and you're celebrating your birthday grow up right but you know that happens right so what's the difference between someone saying hey why don't we have September and uh, October open up because everyone's birthdays around that time why don't you just do that what's it between birthdays and christmas zero it, um the prime minister's official spokesman could, and again christmas not even not everyone even celebrates it everyone's got a flipping birthday not everyone celebrates christmas unless you know if you especially if you're not christian you don't give a crap about christmas anyway um, Prime Minister's official spokesman confirmed ministers were looking at ways to ensure that people can spend time with close family members over Christmas um, at the end of what has been an incredibly difficult year. <laughs> we know it's been difficult. Honestly, I would sacrifice Christmas to have a good new year. If someone told me, right, you'd have to be under lockdown until the end of the year, right? This is November now. If you told me you have to be under lockdown or under some sort of restrictions until the end of the year, right? And you're going to reopen up bars and restaurants with no curfew, but social distancing, all that malarkey, I would take it. I would bite your hand off, mate, legitimately. So all these things about worrying about Christmas, like what would you rather? Would you rather be able to go on holiday from January onwards, right? Some kind of holiday, whether it's domestic or flipping European, right or would you rather have a flipping christmas dinner with your mum and dad because you miss christmas come on man what is this you save some money buy them a present send them some money keep it moving reconvene next year have like a, a delayed a christmas dinner or something god damn these people it comes after the sun reported that families may be able to mix indoors five days for Christmas Eve. And if you're wondering, actually, you know, you're overreacting. No, we're not. Because in the UK, what they do with COVID and these new restrictions and new uh, lockdown regimes or, uh, you know, opening up the economy is that usually they leak this news to the papers, the broadsheets, the rags in the UK. And then they kind of gauge a reaction from what people are saying on social media. And they make some amendments if they have some, you know, some interesting points come up. That's what they've been doing this entire COVID spell. It's su supremely annoying, right? but it is what it is it continues all four uk nations england scotland wales northern ireland are trying to work out a common approach to christmas so families can spread across sorry spread across the uk can still meet up don't get me wrong i am i'm sympathetic i know a lot of people when christmas comes around there are feelings of like missing family right especially if you're close-knit family um you haven't seen your family in flipping ages i get it christmas can be one of those times it can be really difficult to spend alone because you know traditionally christmas is always spent with family i understand it but if ever there was a time where you have to kind of like just grow up and just accept the situation that you're in this is it this is one of the 
key times for your mental fortitude to somehow be strengthened or just to hold on for an extra month. Imagine just even if you're cracking at the seams and you're literally about to throw your head into a concrete wall. This is the one time where I'm just telling you, hold on, hold on, because there is light in the tunnel. We've heard of vaccines coming up, right? There's two vaccines in the works. One that's blimmin' sponsored by Dolly Parton for all of all people. There's hope at the end of the tunnel. There is light, a glimmer of light for you to like look through and be like, it's coming up. If you just take some time to just relax. Don't mix around. Don't be swapping saliva with strangers, right? Don't be rubbing your armpits in someone's eyeball. Just relax for now and then you're gonna be able to enjoy yourself later on. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. Anyway, it continues here. It says, our correspondent said any final decision will not be made for weeks while health officials wait to see whether the cases have started to come down. Like, imagine. Uh, but he said the advice was likely to urge families not to hold a big gatherings and to travel by car rather than public transport. Scientific advice indications uh, that for every day, the measures are relaxed five days Hold on. Scientific advice indicates that for every day that measures are relaxed, five days of tighter restrictions would be needed. Jesus Christ. The government has recorded another 19,609 COVID cases in the UK and 529 deaths within the 28 days of a positive test. Jesus Malaki. Jesus, look at those figures. England is expected to come out of the second lockdown on 2nd December and return to its tier system of localised restrictions with household mixing banned indoors in the top two tiers. Speaking at the Downing Street briefing, the Topkin Public Health England suggested restrictions could be needed on either side of Christmas if the curbs were to be eased over the festive period. That's what I'm saying. If you need to restrict stuff tighter before Christmas and after Christmas, I'd rather just forego it. I'd rather sacrifice my Christmas just so I can enjoy my new year. Honestly, I don't... I don't care. I don't care. Everyone's going nuts. We just want to go out and enjoy ourselves and live our lives as we did previously. We don't give a shit about Christmas. All these flipping small tokens and prizes. This is what got us in this mess in the first place. Eat our help out, they said. That would help the economy. Cool, we did it. Boom, spiking numbers. Enjoy your summer. Travel locally. Boom, spiking cases. Like, Jesus Christos, man. What next? What next? If you honestly, if you're going to allow people to do Christmas, why not allow people to go carnival on August? Why did carnival get cancelled? Tell me. Why the economy gets cancelled? It's outside, in the sun. Like, come on. God damn it, man. Anyway, that, that that's what's going to happen. Let's see anyway. I'm, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Um, I'm hoping we, we just have a thing where they advise. Because uh, look, if you're going to go celebrate Christmas with your family, you're going to go anyway. You're not needed, you're gonna need, you won't need the government to tell you not to go and when to go, right? You're going to go regardless, right? And you're going to do whatever you need to do prior to going whether it's quarantine or not you're gonna do what you want to do you want to live your life so these things are not even needed but i would much rather they just be like hey if we just sacrifice these next couple of months and we kind of hold on hope and the trials and the tests for this vaccine you know uh pass the next necessary steps we could be looking at a pretty optimistic new year who knows life could return to some level of normality by april march whatever imagine they said something like that would you wouldn't you take it or would you really really c crave the idea of digging into a box of celebrations and cussing out your uncle during christmas come on come on but again what do i know what do i know next on list what's we have here um we have here but, 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 oh, yeah, this is good news. So good news in the COVID case, right? COVID good news. We have this news that Pfizer Bio, BioNTech vaccine now at a 95% effectiveness, right? 95% um, and will be submitted for authorization within days, which is amazing to hear, right? So it says here, uh, Pfizer BioNTech vaccine has now pro uh, proved 95% effective in preventing coronavirus and has yet, so and has met the scientific the safety criteria needed for emergency authorization, the firm have said. Pfizer and BioNTech say they plan to submit the COVID-19 vaccine to US regulations for emergency use approval within days after no serious safety concerns were reported. The UK regulated medicines and healthcare products such as regulatory agency MHRA is also poised to fast track authorization for the vaccine after the government ordered enough for 20 million people. Health Secretary Mac Hannock said, um, has said that pending authorization interest will be ready to roll them out to the most vulnerable from the 1st of December, which is 
absolutely incredible news to hear, right? Finally, um, efficacy analysis of the jab showed that 95% were protected from the virus within 28 days of the first dose and up from the results of the phase three trials shared last week. It also proved that 94% effective among adults over the age of 65 who are generally more vulnerable. There are no serious side effects with only 2% of the 43,000 participants reporting a headache and 3.7 reporting fatigue, the company has said. Amazing. But what makes the story even better, right? Even better was that Dolly Parton was involved, brother. Dolly bloody Parton was involved. So Dolly Parton part funded Moderna's promising new coronavirus vaccine here from Pink News. It says in the cosmic balance of the universe, Dolly Parton has long been a force of good, gifting the world with her award-winning music and philanthropy and now a vaccine for the virus that's paralyzed the world and killed 1.2 million people. Moderna's Therapeutics became the second company to report promising preliminary results from the large testing coronavirus vaccine on Monday. Um, 16th of November, for a world anxiously waiting for a morsel of positive news about the pandemic, early trial data from its large continuing study showed that the Massachusetts-based the Massachusetts drug maker drug maker vaccine is 94.5 percent effective and you can thank Dolly Parton for that but Donna's efforts clinched the va- um well, Madonna's efforts to clinch a vaccine were funded in part the Dolly Parton COVID-19 research fund amazing right she got her own research fund um as part of the musician's unwavering support for the Vanderbilt University Medical Center according to an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine the center was one of the key players and institutions in public health that have supported Madonna's month-long aid to contain COVID-19 as much as there's been still months to go with the vaccine being widely available to the public pending the food approval the news and the second vaccine was of all people partly funded by Parton became a glimmer of hope on Twitter and again people are saying some sharing some good news regarding it and that's amazing right what an absolute legend what an absolute queen she is what a great PR and again even if it's not true even if it's somehow conflated it's amazing and if, if ever there was somebody that deserves some good positivity towards what's going on um in this world especially nowadays with what's happening with covid and just generally with celebrities it's definitely dolly Parton. she always comes across like an absolute angel so big up dolly p cool what's i've been doing this week oh i watched this great movie right called mr jones that was recommended to me via lex friedman podcast where he was talking to johan barrack i think right Johan barrack did and he was you know infusing about the wonders of iron rand and bloody blah 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 and he got talking about communism and there's not enough communist um anti-communist movies out there and then he spoke about um this movie called mr jones which is in part you know an autobiographical movie yeah biographical thriller movie i got it here on the wikipedia mr jones 2019 uh directed by um agnazia holland it was selected for a complete uh, the golden bear at 69th berlin international film festival the film loosely tells the story of gareth jones a journalist from wales who in 1933 travels to the soviet union and uncovers the truth about the holo holodoma the man-made famine in ukraine in which million dies under of course the stewardship of stalin and it's an incredible incredibly incredibly well put together movie but the plot is m- bad boy right so spoiler spoiler alert if you've been watching the movie make sure you fast forward this but i'm not understanding why this didn't get more fanfare i don't know when did it exactly come out release wise it says here okay release date i guess internationally it doesn't actually say so it featured in that berlin film festival in early 2019 february but then it started to kind of ramp up its release dates and then now obviously it's come out in the uk from the 7th of february of this year onwards but it's a superb movie And it got me thinking about, um, you know, some of the conspiracy theories people have about the New York Times and how um, they don't trust it and how the mainstream media are lame and the stuff that's going on about the politics today in the United States with the election still pending and, you know, Trump is refusing to concede. Um, It got me thinking, right, because the main culprit of the story or kind of one of the main people that you kind of have to watch for um, who's played expertly by, I don't know what, I've got the actor's name, but um, he plays this character in a movie called Walter Durante, right, who is a Pulitzer Prize winner, um, used to write for the New York Times back in the day, and he covered a lot of the, you know, Soviet stuff at the time, and he was at the time referred to, I think he had, even at the time, I think he published a book called The Soviet Apologist, right, and essentially he basically covered 
um, their backs regarding the famine, didn't really report it in an accurate way, and basically was infusing about the wonders of communism. And um, and obviously collective farming, all this nonsense that essentially caused the famine. And there's some records that say it killed up to 1.2 million people. I think officially um, the Soviet Union said only 200 people perished from the famine, but actual reports from censuses and stuff when you collect them over the years say anywhere up until 1.2 million people were killed um, due to the at the at the hands of this man-made famine so walter Durant, walter Durant is an interesting figure right because essentially he got a pulitzer prize because of the covering that he did or the coverings that he did during that that era right and i think it's here let's read a bit of here um on the wikipedia it says the following um the concern of Duranti's reporting on the famine in soviet ukraine led to a move to posthumously symbolically stripping of the Pulitzer he received in 1932. In response to Stalin's Apologist 1990, the critical biography by Sally J. Taylor, the New York Times assigned a member of its editorial board, Carrie Miller, to write a signed editorial about Durante's work for the Times. In a scathing piece, Meyer said June 24th, 1990, that Durante's articles were some of the most report were some of the worst, worst reporting to appear in this newspaper. Durante Mia Durante May uh, Durante um, Mayer said had bet his career on Stalin's rise and strove to preserve it by ignoring the or excusing Stalin's crimes. The Pulitzer Board in 1990s, right? This is still modern era. It's not like, you know, 1952, right? Recognized the prize, but decided to preserve it as a reward. Four years earlier, in a review of Robert Cross uh, conquest the harvest in the sorrow in 1986, former Moscow uh, bureau reporter Craig White Whitney wrote that Durantes effectively ignored the famine until it was almost over. In 2003, in an uh, international campaign by the Ukraine Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the Pulitzer Board began to a renewed inquiry, and the New York Times hired Mark von Hagen. So again, 1990, they tried to kick up a storm about it. New York Times completely ignored it. 2003, another pe some another group of people take up the baton and try to push for him to ease them, put it surprised if he was stripped, and still New York Times ignored it. Um, it says here, New York Times hired Mark von Hagen, professor of Russian history at the Columbia University, to review Durante's work as whole. Von Hagen found that Durante's reports to be unbalanced, uncritical, and that they were far too often gave voice to Stalin's propaganda. In comments to the press, he stated, For the sake of the New York Times, honour, they should take the prize away. The Times sent Von Hagen's report to the Pulitzer board and left it to the board to make whatever this action they uh, considered appropriate, which they did a lot. We should read a lot about it, right? The New York Times would always kind of push the responsibility to take the Pulitzer Prize or to make a stand away back to the Pulitzer board, knowing forward that they weren't going to take it away from him so that then they can say hey we we did our best and just kind of throw their hands up right so new york times has been trashed from from ages ago it continues here in an accompanying report at uh, the new york times publisher arthur ox uh schulenberger jr said durante's work sovereignly set Durante's work sovereignly and it said it should be recognized for what it was by its editors by its Pulitzer Prize judges seven decades ago jesus christos ultimately sis gisler administrator of the Pulitzer board Declined to revoke the reward in a press release dated November 21st, 2003. He stated that in regard to the 13 articles by Durante, 1933 submitted for the award, that there was no clear or convincing evidence of deliberate deception, the relevant standard in this case. Imagine, imagine in 2003, right? In 2003, a member of the Pulitzer board, um, someone from the New York Times, is basically trying to defend one of their editors, one of their writers, because they were basically a Stalin apologist. Just imagine it. So, if you're out there and you're thinking to yourself, oh, why are these right-wing people making all this noise and kicking up a fuss about the election? They can kick up a fuss as much as they want, right? More likely than not, Biden's definitely going to win. It's very unlikely they're going to somehow recount the votes and it's going to go in John Trump's favor. It's not going to happen. But they're allowed to be skeptical. You're allowed to be skeptical, right? You're allowed to kind of kick up a bit of fuss and say, hey, why is the media declaring Joe Biden the winner, right? That's not how democracy works, right? Count the votes, um, take your time. And then when you want to declare, you declare the person wants to concede it, do whatever it may be. But it's like, idea that it's somehow normal and it's somehow okay for everyone just to move on except what the media says when this is the what the media were doing in 2003 with stalin not even trump forget trump right trump turned out to kind of fit he turned out to be nothing more than bluster right for the most part he wasn't the second coming of hitler he was just a pretty ineffective um inefficient and just rubbish pre president for the most part looking from the outside right there was so much more you could have done using the advantage of kind of being a, a bit of a an outsider right 
having no real political um, education or background. He could have come in with a little bit more of a sledgehammer and broken some things down, changed some, shook some things up, right? And actually cleaned the swamp as he effectively was trying to say. But in the end, he was too concerned about preserving his own self-image, too selfish in that regard, more worried about his image and how he was hiring and firing people than actually, you know, preserving some sort of legacy and whatever it may be, or lasting legacy. He didn't really care about that. He just happens to care about the immediate. So he ended up kind of fizzling out into nothing for the most part. And now there is a feeling of like a return to normalcy which is a bit scary if you think about me in my opinion in it with whole biden thing but hey i get it right if you're an american it can be exhausting waking up every day to trump tweets and having it be on the front of your mind especially if you're an immigrant and stuff you have these um existential worries that ice are going to come down knocking on your door and strip and pull you up away from your laptop and send you back to guatemala where you've never been right i completely understand that right or Guatem guatemala guatemala wow i mixed those two words up didn't i but regardless um i think in the end I understand why people have a real uh, ad adhesion to things like New York Times and mainstream media. I get it. Especially after reading, really watching this movie, I was like, oh my God. This guy was a Stalin apologist. And again, movies can over exaggerate things, right? Because Walter Durante in this movie, he's looked at as a bit of a conniving scumbag, right? I'm sure there's more to the story. But for the most part, if we, if what is believed is true, especially if you, especially um, considering again, spoiler report for the actual spoiler alert for everyone that's actually watched the movie, the actual main protagonist of it, Mr. Jones, the guy that actually risked his life to go to the former Soviet Union to go and investigate what's actually going on, discovers this famine is worse than can be imagined. People are eating tree bark and cannibalism and all this sort of madness, right? It, it inadvertently that reporting that he did on the former Soviet Union it eventually led to him actually dying, where he was going to report something else in thailand i think in his early 30s he actually got assassinated um when people start thinking allegedly that it might have been some people in the russian special service or whatever maybe or secret service sorry um so all stars do point to the fact that that world durant guy was definitely making excuses for stalin during that time and this mr jones character gareth jones was upholding or kind of adhering to his general journalistic morals or whatever it may be code and going and seeking the truth seeking the truth wherever it may lead him right and not being as much as unpartisan as, as possible as it can be and yet in 2003 as early as 2003 the new york times refused to strip him of the place or to kind of you know sign on off of it they were all right to have people investigate on their behalf and publish the findings but they won't put any pressure on the Pulitzer board or nothing of that sort and even the Pulitzer board themselves to do that is just unequivocally absolutely insane so if you know somebody that's out there complaining about the results and they're getting on your nerves let them fizzle out and say what they want to say but they have a reason to be skeptical right if, if the new york times is calling this election and they were also you know telling people that it was okay for will Durant to still have a Pulitzer surprise after making excuses for stalin you know after causing the famine that led to 1.2 million people dying in the former ukraine or in ukraine sorry then i definitely have an understanding of why these guys are skeptical definitely do but definitely make sure you check it out man it's called mr jones it's an incredibly 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 decent movie um out in was it 2009 or 2009 2020 again i'm not too sure why it didn't get much more um, a lot more hype than it probably has maybe because of the, the topic matter that it features and you know people are maybe have this hope that communism may or socialism or maybe yeah some version of communism and socialism might work in the west i'm not too sure why they don't really promote it maybe that's a reason but regardless definitely check it out mr jones available now i guess on most streaming platforms check it out check it out Okay, next on the list. What else do we have here? Let's move on. No one will waste any more time. Oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. So, unfortunately, over the what last week or so, Octavian's life has come crashing down, like tumbling, blowing up in bits and pieces, right? And you know, it's he has no one to blame but himself. Unfortunately, no one to blame but himself. And it brings me nice onto his thing, right? before i go on to octavian's story my position is that somehow i don't know why it is but from the stuff i've been looking at from the outside looking in again i haven't been investigating these issues too closely but from what i've observed and the news i've kind of been hearing for some odd reason i don't know why it is but i get the feeling that black people in hip-hop whether it's the uk or the us don't get cancelled regardless of what indiscretion that they do 
they never get cancelled in the same way white celebrities do. I'm not so sure if it's kind of in the mix of this, you know, uh, post George Floyd world. No one wants to piss off black people and stuff, whatever it may be. But there are some things that black people do that they can get away with that a white equivalent actor or white equivalent artist does. They will be completely cancelled and erased from society. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining, right? Because I am black myself so if i went out there and did some absolute madness right kick some old lady in the street or something i would be more than happy to know that whew, i'm not gonna lose my record contract right that's what that'll be a good thing to know good to know but somehow it can be very disturbing when that person kicks an old lady in the street and then goes and curb stomps her into the side of the street mercilessly until her brains are splattered all across the side of the drain that obviously isn't great right um and it feels like for some reason you hear these stories and there isn't any repercussion. I don't know why it is. It really makes no sense. So I was, I kind of had this thing that I always say that black people don't get cancelled. I just don't think it ever, ever, ever happens because the example that I use is that if, let's say, Skepta was Harry Styles and two of his friends went into prison, one for recording his girlfriend because she was ODing and one for support was it rape and uh imprisonment and stuff right more likely than not that would affect harry styles career it shouldn't because it's not his responsibility right skept it's not his fault his friends get up to madness behind his back right but just the association alone especially even more so with skepta he was shouting out solo four or five you know um sion was all over the place and again i know sion right like i've known i, I know him right I, I hang out with him back in the day so my heart goes out to that kid it's a bad situation to be in but let's call a spade a spade bro if skepta was harry styles his career would be finished but for some reason no one cares everyone moves on people keep it trucking now maybe because skepta is a, a bit of a g in that regard he doesn't move in a certain way he doesn't necessarily talk to press too much so it's pretty difficult to kind of get to him i imagine or talk about the stuff that he does maybe because the people he's around himself with are a little bit clued up they sort of insulate him i don't know what the reason is but i just know there is definitely a difference in a reaction and consequences when it comes to how black artists and white artists are dealt with in pop culture whether it's kind of white guilt because of george floyd i don't know regardless support us but anyway um one person that might actually um kind of you know uh call into question my theory is octavian because it seems like he might be the first proper proper celebrity proper black artist or yeah black hip-hop artist to be cancelled you know immediately and it happened pretty quickly within like a couple of days right and, and again his crime is you know abhorrent that needs to be said put that little disclaimer right there so i don't look like an absolute psycho and i'm advocating for flipping domestic violence but it's very interesting to, to note that that this is and i i get the feeling that if this would have happened post george floyd his career probably might have not devalued or um deteriorated the way it has done and i'm also thinking if this happened post covid it wouldn't deteriorate the way it does i always said i think i said in the beginning covid is the worst time to get cancelled because everyone's on their phone so pe and people's emotions are somewhat heightened right they can kind of people are um People are relating a lot more to people that not, that they don't share any sort of life experiences with. Just because you're on your phone, you're all kind of going through this so-called collective experience unless you're somewhere living in the hidden hills. Now, I don't give a shit what you're doing because you're not going through this with the same with us. But for the most part, we're all going through this whole thing together, right? We're all kind of in this fun situation. So it feels like if you do get cancelled, this is the worst time because everyone is paying attention right and everyone's really scrutinizing the wrong that you've done and judging you a lot and this is what happened to octavian unfortunately and his career for the most part looks like it's completely over so headline reads as follows uk rapper octavian has been dropped by label of abuse allegations so it says here rapper octavian has been dropped by his label one day after no one day before his debut album was set to release after he was accused of abusive behavior by an ex-girlfriend absolutely mad epic um grand opening grand closing that one so it continues here over the past weekend octavian goji okay that's actually a real name didn't know that was accused of physical abuse by a musician who goes by the name of emo baby who dated the rapper for three years on both twitter and instagram she accused him of constant physical and verbal and psychological abuse including hitting her with a hammer after pressuring her to get an abortion when you hear that right first off the bat you think okay you're out of here innit? you're done it's just over isn't it like you know so, like if ever there was a time if ever there was something that you shouldn't do right to get you cancelled it'd be beating up a girlfriend that you've been with for three years right and then forcing her to get an abortion with a hammer you're probably not going to get a second chance in it so when i saw that immediately i was like oh man he's definitely going to he's definitely going to scupper my idea that black people don't get cancelled because this is a cancelable offense if ever there was one it continues 
Shusha included videos and photos of the alleged abuse and claimed his label had tried to pay her with 20000 in exchange for an NDA suggesting that they were aware of the alleged violence. This is the most interesting part of it. Now, we know monsters exist. This is the thing that I have. My issue with this whole thing, even with the whole Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein issue, right? We know monsters exist. Monsters exist and unfortunately they're going to exist but they existed before Harvey and they exist after Harvey, right? So we can't avoid that, unfortunately. Some people are going to be at the behest of them or some people are going to be within their grips. We maybe have to educate people in terms of avoiding them, whatever it may be. But for the most part, if you're manipulative and clever enough, you can get around some of those things and end up abusing people. It's unfortunate, but that is the name of the game. The issue, I think, in general, isn't the actual monster. It's the support system around them that sort of allows it to happen and turns a blind eye. Those are the people that I have absolutely no sympathy or patience for. Like all those people that you saw featured on the Jeffrey Epstein seen documentary on netflix a couple of women who hired other girls to go get abused i think there was one lady specifically who rejected Harv jeffrey epstein's advances right he tried to get with her she basically told him to f off but then he suggested hey why don't you get somebody else who's up for it and she suggested them so if you went through that terrible ordeal emotionally and physically distressing right waking up in sweats but then you are willingly putting other girls up for that you're a scumbag but those are the people that are essentially allowing monsters to get away with what they're doing that's the issue so that's a conversation no one wants to have, really, right? Why? Because Octavian, again, he's had a short career in music. He's not been around for that long. Maybe I'd say five years in, in kind of like everyone's or everyone's kind of consciousness, right? And maybe before that, he was hustling underground. But for the most part, I've been aware of him maybe for about five years, right? If that's the case, and he is a monster, as, as this girl has proved, or this girl has basically laid out the evidence, which basically looks like he is a bit of a psychopath and a monster, I'm pretty sure within those five years, he's had evidence of doing it, of doing those things to other people, or he's shown kind of hints of the person that he is. Because it's very rare that suddenly you wake up and you turn into a person that's going to force your girlfriend to get an abortion, threaten her with a hammer, beat her up, leave her with bruises and cuts and all this malarkey, cuss her out of her name. It's very unlikely that you are doing that. It's very unlikely that that's just a thing that happens overnight. There's definitely going to be a pattern of that prior. So for your label to go ahead and go and offer that girl for 20 grand to silence her is absolutely abhorrent. And that's what everybody in the industry should be kind of scream for the rafters why are we allowing these labels in the industry to do such a thing like why does this even exist why is this even a, a practice going on behind the scenes that's actually what people should be talking about because the monsters are always going to exist but let's eradicate the support system or the people that, that turn a blind eye the people that are not brave enough to step out step out in front and say hey that's not cool because unless unless we do that to those people and call them accountable nothing's ever going to change because it's unlikely you're ever going to you know eradicate the world of flipping serial killers and sexual abuse abusers and all these sort of flipping absolute monstrous people pedophiles and stuff you sound like you we're not going to do that well what we can do is eviscerate their support system so we don't breed as many of those people and so they don't kind of hide out in the open we can't allow those things to happen it continues the rappers vehemently and denied the accusations, saying that the while he did not date he was never abusive and would deal with the accusations legally <laughs> Which is, I don't know, how do you, uh, that's, what, that, that's the other side of me as well that's kind of just intrigued. How do you honestly defend yourself when your ex-girlfriend brings up pictures, videos, texts that basically paint you out to be an absolute psychopath, right? How do you do that? Especially when it's somebody that you love. Because I never understood anyway. I never got the whole like beating of girls anyway in general. I don't ever agree with that. I think it's, you know, way, there is, I wouldn't say there's no excuse for it. But I just think when you love somebody, especially in a relationship, um, and you know the person, right? Come assume your relationship. Um, and it's come, it's getting to a point where you feel like you want to hit her. Maybe it's the time to kind of call quits on the relationship before that gets to physical, you know, it escalates physically. You don't need to get there. You just need to kind of call it quits. And maybe people's reluctance to call it quits and to kind of enjoy it. Because there is this weird fetishization within some cultures of toxic relationships and stuff. That might be a concern. But in general, I've never understood why some guys, especially hip hop artists or rappers, whatever they may be, um, always resort to hitting the girl. I don't understand that. Usually the girls involved are like people that have maybe kind of come up with you, right? So essentially they, she's been around when you were eating flipping noodles out of a cup or it's basically a, a, someone that's a fan of your music. So regardless of the of where they, of what point in life they met you, that's a person that completely adores you, right? From everything from from the soles of your feet to the crown of your head they adore you right so to somehow get to a point where you want to hit that person it just doesn't make sense to me maybe you're hitting a random person right you, that you don't know again hitting women you shouldn't be doing anyway but that might make some sense there might be some 
event you're at, something happens and some physical, something physical, and you feel like you need to defend yourself, whatever. But someone that you love, how's that even making any sense for three years? And this guy honestly thinks he can defend himself. Like again, who knows? Innocent until proven guilty. You can't let the court, court of public opinion judge him, but unfortunately, it has already. But if he can honestly defend himself, and again, I don't know what he's going to prove and put out there that's going to clear his name what can you say that she pulled a gun on you or a knife like what can you honestly say that's going to just and even that does that justify you telling her to get an abortion with a hammer like what kind of what kind of what context can you add to that story really um, i'll be interested to know and anyway, it continues in response a rapper has been dropped by his record label black butter and his uk publicity team pattern publicity the label said in a short statement that they would not release his debut album alpha due this week which is mad isn't it? you never see that happening really and there might be some legal there might be some um legal repercussions that they might suffer from octavian's team if that's possible as well isn't it like just scrapping his entire release off the back of an accusation he hasn't been tried in court i know the girl put a put through a police report but they might be in trouble with some there but again it's impressive to see i've never actually seen this happen in real time in such quick succession um it continues um we at black butter have taken the decision not to continue working with octavian and we will not be releasing the album which is ironic I, ironic too if you believe what the girl said that they offered the 20 grand and now they're suddenly becoming the moral moral police like okay mate um we don't condone the domestic abuse of any kind and we have suggested that octavian seek professional help at his home while the statement does not directly address the accusations they were aware of the alleged abuse it implies they were not uh, they were not in her statement Ima baby alleged that several album tracks detail violent fantasies about her uh da, 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 da. octavian was slated to perform across australia at the fomo this january but cancelled a month out due to the album recording commitments he has previously worked with the likes of skepta diplo M M Mur muramasa asa flag future da, 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 many more anyway so let's let's read what she actually said about the issue right because that's the most um shocking and revealing part of this whole thing and if you just of like man the scumbags that exist in this industry especially if you're kind of dealing with girls like imagine how you're like how are you treating women like this is just mad in it so this is one of the videos that she posted again have some screams in the background <laughs> under look maybe it's just a, a fyi if you're a young guy out there there should be no occasion in your life, in your dating life, um, you know, in you kind of running around town where any girl you're dealing with should ever sound like that. If you're if if a girl you're dealing with is making those kind of noises, look yourself in the mirror and check yourself. You definitely need a wake up call. Like you should not be um doing anything that results in a woman screaming and pleading like that in that sort of like helpless, um, high pitched, painful voice. Like that shouldn't be happening under any circumstances. Yeah. Record me and put me on the internet. And beat the shit out of me. Good friend you are. Kind of and beat the shit out of me. And, and is it me or can you hear a beat at the at the bottom of this when he's talking? <laughs> beat the shit out of me. I'll beat the shit out of you because of your fucking cunt. You won't get in my house. I'll beat the shit out of you. <laughs> you yeah. Record me and put me on the internet. And beat the shit out of me. <laughs> Bro, who talks to their girl like this? This is what I'm, I'm. It honestly boggles. First of all, isn't it? If you're a girl, like how could again relationships are so hard to talk about because it's so messy. It's so many things involved in it, like family. It's just, ah. Uh, but I don't understand how girls can give these guys the light of day. Like, how can you give guys like this this sort of attention and your presence and whatever it may be? It doesn't make any sense. Like he's an absolute piece of shit, bro. Talking to you like that in in general in front of the dogs. In front of your babies. Like, how are you talking to her that for? That's a madness. It continues here. And then there's, okay, there's an there's a image that she posted of a screenshot of the police report that she filed. Bloody hell, man. Let's, what's the other piece of thing she put there? Da, da, da. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. I really don't know what to say here. What's the other bit? Let's load this up here. I think it's a statement, isn't it, right? Uh, but, but, but it's, a, it's a statement, yeah. Um, her statement says, I was in a relationship with Octavian over the last three years and I'm finally speaking out about the constant physical, verbal and psychological abuse I was subjected to during that relationship. A police report has been made, which has taken a little longer as I'm in a different country for my own safety and well-being. So I guess off bat, if she's putting a police report through, then she has receipts, she has evidence 
and she really really hates this guy like le- like legitimately this is the end enough is enough because usually in these toxic relationships from what i've read online and where in between the in the between the lines people just move on right they don't want to be reminded of whatever they went through they'd rather just compartmentalize it and continue on doing what they're doing suffering in silence whatever it may be doing seeking help from psychologists but they don't want to go through the rigmarole filing a police report giving evidence going to court blood blah, blah, blah. just want to be rid of that person and move completely on move to another country and continue the fact that she's going to these lengths shows you just how bad the relationship got it continues here the first instance of physical abuse came shortly after i fell pregnant god damn it (sighs) with his child after pressuring me to get an abortion he attacked me for the first time kicked me in my stomach burst my lip attacked me with a hammer and threatened to kill me i was shortly later asked to sign an nda and attempt to gag me for twenty thousand pounds which i didn't sign so again, where are you going to get that NDA from? Octavia doesn't strike me as the most intelligent guy in the world. Judging by some of the screenshots that he's been providing in his defense, he doesn't really come across as the sharpest knife in the toolbox or the sharpest screwdriver in the toolbox, whatever that, that flipping <laughs> saying goes. So for sure, somebody helped him out get the MDMA. The, the MDMA. So he definitely wasn't a bit of MDMA. But someone definitely helped him put together that NDA. And most likely it was definitely his, what, his label for the most part, right? So people need to ask some questions. Why are his record label trying to silence uh, the, the girl in a domestic dispute? Something like this, something, especially something so serious. They kind of aided and abetted him. Because monsters don't do these things alone. From what I've read, monsters are definitely helped. It continues. From the first instance of abuse from April 2020, when I finally left, the uh, no, from the first instance of abuse to April 2020, when I finally left, the abuse became routine and was often prompted by his cocaine use. <laughs> Why are we surprised? I said it recently to somebody. I remember mentioning to somebody that, oh, um, I was wondering, oh, what happened to Octavio then? He kind of fell off. I think after I've listened to a couple of the singles or maybe the future one, that single didn't really go anywhere. He kind of wasted that future feature. And it kind of made me remember this one guy, I forgot who it was, someone on the podcast once said, if you ever if you ever kind of sat around thinking, oh, what happened to he or she in the entertainment industry, more likely than not that person either isn't working because they're a dickhead or they've succumbed to drugs and alcohol. Those are usually the two um, things that make you think, oh, what's happened to so-and-so? Because most of the time, most people in the entertainment industry, artists, wherever they are, they want to be up around. They want to be up in the action, right? They want to be quote unquote relevant. No one wants to just disappear for the most part, five, six years and just not make any music. No one, you know, the Frank Oceans and Playboy Carriers in the world, they're sort of the rarities. Most people like being in front of the camera. They like their name ringing out. They want to be given an interview, blah, 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 blah. So if somebody isn't being featured on new songs, isn't being around, isn't in the mix, it's usually because they're a dickhead behind the scenes and no one wants to give them opportunity or they succumb to drugs and alcohol. Bingo. It continues here. I was frequently kicked, punched and strangled, dragged out of the house with my clothing or hair and he would smash furniture and threaten me with a bat or attack me with other items like a screwdriver. What a good time, eh? What a good time. God almighty. The reason I decided to share my story with Octavian now before his album is I don't want anyone to look up to him, especially not young girls, and listen to the dark music he makes to celebrate his abuse. He has an entire song about the violently killing me with a machete called My Head. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. Which in a since deleted interview with DJ Semtex, Octavian admits to a song being about me and proudly calls it art. He also has a new song on the album named Rock Smiles, which is about two men attacking me at the end of the song. He says that he wants to kill me for telling everyone that he has a don't that what for what he has done. I felt I had to share all this and speak my truth before these songs were out. So if ever you're wondering, oh, this girl's clout chasing, why is she putting out her album? She's telling you clearly she hates this guy so much that she wants to damage his ability to put out an album and also remind his fans that he's not who he says he is. If that isn't unequivocal proof that this guy is a piece of shit, I don't know what is. And again, I'm one of the people that likes to, you know, I don't like people getting judged in a court of public opinion. But sometimes you got to call a spade a spade, man. This guy sounds like a prick. You know what I mean? Um, it continues here uh, um, this is just a fraction of what I have experienced and what I have to say you can read my whole account of my experience in my highlights and pictures here of bruises on her like again FYI to the young boys out there to the young G's the young gunners your girl should never have these these bruises on her Not, never never these cuts and bruises they, and under any circumstances it just shouldn't happen god almighty these young boys are moving mad innit 
You got my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's different. Isn't it? What was going on that led to you to make that? I was breaking up with my girl. My girl was in the studio, and I remember sitting in the studio and I was like fucking writing these lyrics. <laughs> it was just like, so every single song on that track is about like a moment. Yes, yeah, so what you said. So this is the lyrics. Been thinking about killing you, baby. You fucking bitch. Grab the gun on my right. Push the good thoughts to the sideway. Bitch, you can't talk to me. I ain't got time. Too busy cutting lines. <laughs> Mate, this guy does sniffs a couple lines and starts beating up his girlfriend. What an absolute piece of shit. Um, usually, when you do that, you're meant to be celebrating, right? And getting on with your girl, having a good time, playing some music, dancing in the living room. You should be elbowing her in her face, bruv. What are you doing? Um, anyway, continues. Bitch, you can't kill me. No, bitch, you can't talk to me. I ain't got time. Too busy cutting lines. I'll kill you if you're in sight. Yeah, give me some molly or I'll start a riot. I'm moving kind now, saying, can you be mine? Grab the machete and then I put it to your belly. Like, ay, 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 ay. ay. So yeah, man, Octavian is done for the most part, it looks like. And I don't know what to say, man. Like, it sounds like it's well-deserved because um, he sounds like a piece of shit. But obviously, you never know, innit? He might have some evidence that might absolutely corroborate his story that this is being pulled out of, you know, um, we're only seeing one side of the story, more evidence to come, my support as well as some malarkey, but it's definitely, this definitely puts into question my theory that black people can't be cancelled. Octavian, sounds like he's cancelled. Album, completely been scrapped for the most part, it looks like, from his record label. Agency has completely abandoned him. The only person I think is in his corner still of his manager, it looks like, from the looks of it. But yeah, let me know your thoughts, man. What do you think? Do you think, do you believe his girlfriend's account of the story? Do you think that Tyvin should be given his time in court to defend himself in the proper way, through the proper channels? Do you think people are going overboard? Um, do you think there needs to be more scrutiny placed upon the record labels for uh, kind of facilitating and housing an artist like this, knowing full well what he's doing behind closed doors? Do the women in his life have some responsibility, knowing how much of an abuse he was over a long period of time? I need to speak up now. Whatever you may say, let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts and opinion regarding the issue. Let me know in the comments down below. Okay, moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on. What else do we have here? Ba, ba, ba. Oh, in more scumbag guy news, in more scumbag guy news, unfortunately, one of techno pioneers and somebody I looked up to a lot in terms of his ability to DJ and how he mixes and his sort of showmanship behind the decks, Derek May has been accused by multiple women of sexual harassment. And this is an entire article on Resident Advisor. Not only on Resident Advisor, I think also DJ Mag had an entire article on it too where they basically um, went through accounts of past people that Derek May has sort of come in contact with in a nightlife scene, who he unfortunately, no, who for, unfortunately for them were subject to sexual harassment and assault in various ways. And some of the accounts are just harrowing to read, man. Just re like, you look at me like, Jesus Christ. And it's odd because I think in the beginning of the year, not the middle of the year, there were rumblings around that, um, there was kind of a story in the works about Derek May. There was obviously those posts on Facebook um, concerning a certain individual, I forgot his name, who kind of had an axe to ground with Derek. I don't think he, they got on well. I think something to do with a record or something behind the scenes. So he, got, he went out of his way to kind of sully Derek May's name. So sometimes you look at that, you think, hold on, is this guy just got an axe to ground? He's making up stories. But then there'll be, you read through the comments on Facebook, you say some person heard a different story. They heard this, they heard that, you know, in the scene that he is a bit of a creep behind the scenes. Loads of really bad stuff coming out, right? Because that's what you don't want. When a story comes out about your rumors, the first thing that you want, you want your community to kind of like gather around and sort of protect you and say, nah, this guy's a top boy. But when no one does that and everyone's carrying out and saying they've all heard secondhand, thirdhand stories about how much of a dick you are behind the scenes, you definitely have to be worried. And I guess reading this account and looking at the list of people and the time frame is well included, it doesn't look good for my guy. It doesn't look good for him at all. Um, yeah, so this is the article here. It said, an investigation, RA by Annabella Ross, alleged victims of the Detroit techno and pioneer describe a string of incidences over the last two decades in US, Europe, and New Zealand. Oh my God. Um, so it continues. This is an article. It says, there are a few living things. There are a few living figures in Detroit music as historically significant as Derek May, created as one of the creators of techno music alongside Juan Atkins and Kevin Saunderson. Uh, May produced seminal tracks such as Strings of Life, uh, founded a hugely influential Transmet label, and has performed on a near weekly basis at clubs, festivals around the world for more than 30 years. But it's interesting, isn't it? Apart from Strings of Life, what else has he made that's been as good as that? Not as good. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. That's his flipping, you know, not Magnus Opus, but that's his fucking, you know, 
that's something that's going to go down in techno history but it there's no coincidence for me since the allegations came out and since people have been distancing themselves from him behind the scenes that his production quality has sort of suffered is it just, is it just me because I haven't really been checking for Derek May production in years. Don't get me wrong, but I'd love to know. Let me know in the comments. It continues. He acted as a mentor and second wave Detroit techno luminaries, including Carl Craig, Stacey Pullman, and until recently was on the board of the directors at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. Lesson learned was the fact that since last November, May has been subject to a series of sexual harassment and allegations, assault allegations, sorry. These allegations have existed largely in the Facebook vacuum for the past 12 months until the recent death of the AG Eric Murillo, who has been charged with rape, attracted um, greater scrutiny to the similar claim against May, which led to a number of international festivals and events, including Paris week electronic week and fact 5-1 the hacienda to cancel may schedule appearances interesting for weeks i has been investigating the claims of sexual assault and harassment made against derek may i has spoken to 16 people who claim to have sexually assaulted or assault arrest by may as well as many witnesses and close friends of the alleged victims who can support these claims taken together these accounts portray a pattern of sexual abuse that dates back to 20 years and it occurred in numerous countries asked to comment on these claims may made the following statement as a black man, what the fuck is he talking about? When I read that, I knew this guy was on bullshit time. Bruv, you've been accused of sexually assaulting people for 20 years. You're sounding like flipping Jeffrey Epstein, you know, Mark II, bruv, like, or Mark III after Eric Murillo. And you're sta starting a statement with other, as a black man. That's the danger we have at the moment. All this identity politics stuff, there is no limit to who can use it, right? You can't say you can use it and that person can't. And they're going to use it just to protect their own back. What does as a black man have to do with anything? As a black man working in a white dominated and openly biased industry, I'm expected to have learned the painful lesson that there is no such thing as truth, fairness or due process. Um, when will the long story history of weaponizing sexuality of African men end? <laughs> oh, this guy is a psychopath. What an absolute loon. What? Look, that first paragraph is mad, right? But I get it. Weaponizing African man sex, African men sexual, African American men sexuality. What? What? Anyway, must I collaborate under the duress of my own victimization at the hands of an openly hostile press that amplifies the so-called fears of privileged anonymous women in an internet media lynching? <laughs> I have no interest in legalizing these distortions. Women are the conduit of life, and as such, are to be protected and not exploited. I live by those words. Again, what is he saying? No denial, no flat out refusal of what happened, the claims, whatever, just loads of flipping um, token word, smurf ship, whatever it may be called. La later, later. Anyway, let's continue the allegations, right? Um, 2014, Audrey attended, of course, I'm, I'm assuming his names have all been, have all been changed to protect the innocent. Um, yeah, that, I think Audrey was the worst one. Audrey said, attended a Derek May gig in the UK as an 18-year-old. She was still in high school at the time. She was a huge techno fan and May, he was her hero. Audrey's friend had told her that she had heard May was a womanizer and said that when May wanted to introduce women, he would stare at them for ages without saying a word. Audrey laughed it off and disbelief at the time. 2014, right? If 1999 doesn't feel so far away, 2014 feels like an age away. Jesus Christos. And he's been doing it since then. At the gig in the middle of May set, May spotted Audrey with a female friend dancing at the front of the crowd. He laughed and said to them, I'll see you ladies later. Audrey was thrilled. I thought, oh my God, he's noticed me. After his set, May approached Audrey at the bar area of the club and invited her and her female friend back to his hotel for an after party. At Audrey's request, her male friend was allowed to come too. Some of her friends also planned to meet them later at the hotel, but were turned away at reception when they tried to join them. So... That's the first warning sign there, right? Number one, if you're 18 and you're going to a techno party and a guy in his mid-30s, late-30s, um, late early 40s, mid 40s, whatever it may be, if a guy is old enough to be an older brother, whoever it is, right? Some oldie guy, whatever, even if he's in your age range, don't go back to the hotel room. Don't. Don't. Just don't. Right? And especially if they especially if they allow you to bring a friend, that's always just to be a warning, right? Because they've definitely tried to play that trick where they're like, Yeah, I'm comfortable, bring your friend. But then when you try and bring other friends that aren't girls, more of them to come to the room and he denies their entry, big warning sign. It continues here. In the hotel room, May ordered red wine from the room service and poured a glass for everyone. For about two hours, we were having the best conversation ever, she says, talking about music, talking about politics. I thought this is just an incredible experience. Again. 
this is what I mean about disgusting people, right? Like, I have, honestly, I'm an aspiring DJ myself, right? I have absolutely no interest. Like, part of the reason for me, I think most people, when you're a fan of a, a, an industry, you're a fan of a subculture, you just want to be involved, right? You go to your first club night, you, you even just the person at the door seems cool. The person that's putting the, you know, put us in a cloakroom, the bartenders, the person's putting the event together, let alone the DJs, right? You just want to be involved in that life, right? In that lifestyle, in that subculture. That's what you want to be a part of. So when you start promoting parties, starting DJing, the last thing that you're thinking about is hooking up with girls, in my opinion, or hooking up with people in general. That might be a good bonus at the end of it, maybe getting fucked up, having drinks, but part of the reason you're getting into it is that whole experience, the whole queuing up, hearing the bass rattling through the building, um, getting a stamp, putting out your ID, putting your cloak in the cloakroom, going to the toilet, hanging out on the dance floor meeting new people smoking area that's what you want to be a part of isn't it so imagine you finally reach that zenith right you've reached that mountain which is difficult to do right it's very very hard um there's probably more djs than there are opportunities out there so for you to make it in general regardless of your color creed wherever your background is you should be respected you should be adored you should be clapped at well done you smashed it to finally get there right and have fans right people that actually love you they want to come and see you play somewhere that are gonna you know put you know take their hard-earned money to spend on your merch on your on your tickets on your music that you put out to then to bring them into your safe space and to exploit them in that scenario there's no excuses there you are a piece of shit you are in the complete piece of shit that's the thing that just breaks my heart when I hear those kind of things, right? Look how excited she sounded at that time, being 18 years old, meeting your hero, Derek May, and then the conversation goes left. Like, God almighty, man. Ugh. Anyway, continues. Audrey says May had been nothing but respectful and charming and that he hadn't said anything sexual nor made any move on me. There was no flirtation coming from him on either end. Audrey said she began to feel groggy and tired and lay down on the bed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, again, does this mean she was feeling groggy because he spiked her drink? I don't know. But whenever they make these make these illusions, it always feels like to me like they can't flat out say he put anything in a drink because they don't know. But it always looks bad, isn't it? Bloody hell. The next thing I remember, she says, as I began to regain consciousness, was someone to the right of me touching on my side. I opened my eyes and there was Derek May standing completely naked in front of me with an erection. Jesus Christus. I was still groggy in complete shock and I couldn't say a word. Then he kissed me and shoved his tongue down my throat and I just thought, this is so wrong. This isn't what I wanted or expected. I was not in any way attracted to him and had given him no indication whatsoever that I was sexually interested in whatsoever. Like, God. Honestly, again, for all my guys out there that are in the nightlife scene, please, if ever there was a time to be gentlemanly and to be a stand-up dude, it's nightlife. Because I think from the accounts I've read, being a woman in the nightlife scene or being a woman in, yeah, in general, right, especially after dark, is so difficult. There are so many creeps and weirdos out there. I guess when it goes dark anyway, all the weirdos and freaks come out. So it is what it is. But if ever there's a time that you should be a little bit more of a stand-up dude and go above and beyond to make sure whatever you're doing and wherever you're at is a safe space, this would be it. Especially if you're an artist, right? Because I imagine this this situation goes another way. And, you know, Derek May is a top dude. He's he's ordering stuff for them. He's buying them drinks. He's giving them amazing stories. He's letting them have signed EPs on or vinyl bits and pieces. He let them take pictures. If they want to kip, he lets them take their bed and use the floor. Imagine what that does for the fandom of somebody. You're 18 years old. You are forever going to be a Derek May fan. You're going to be preaching the gospel of Derek May to all your friends, right? Imagine if you're just a bit of a decent dude. But that one experience at 18, even if you're saying, imagine if you says to me, oh no, I was fucked up, man. I, I didn't know what I was doing. It was a mistake. It was one of occasion that's ruined your reputation for that person who's then going to tell all the other friends and that's going to leave a bad impression for all these other people that you never met who are going to completely write you off based on a story that they've heard from a girl that was with you in 2004 just imagine just imagine so again uh, i know this you know monsters exist and stuff but i would hope especially in my experience that's what i would be doing i'd be going above and beyond to make everyone comfortable just so that they can come to my next show again. I won't be trying to stand stark naked next to them in the bed and try and sexually assault them whilst they're sleeping. Like, are you insane? Anyway, Audrey pushed May off her. She was still fully clothed. Audrey said and to me, a female friend who also seemed disorientated. Again, there's assumptions that he might spike the drink. She said, let's go. Audrey's male friend later told her that while she was passed out, May said, you can go now. And he obliged. 
another warning sign okay if you're the male friend wake your friend up and tell them that yeah, you're going man don't just leave on his request oh yeah, yeah, yeah um as audrey and her female friend gathered their bloggers to leave may started shouting and insulting audrey of course classic sign of a dickhead um i thought this is so surreal i'm having an argument with derek may a man old enough to be my father whose records i own and who is currently sitting naked in the bed when i was clear that they were about to leave may started may stared at audrey angrily and intensely without speaking he says she says thank goodness i had been told he he used this tactic on women so i knew exactly what he was doing but it was intimidating and frightening unless i guess oh it's that tactic that he does where he just stares at you hoping that you can change your mind i guess audrey calls audrey recalls being so out of it when she and her friend were trying to leave the hotel that they ended up in the car park but they eventually found their way out of the building after leaving the hotel audrey immediately called another male friend in tears and told him what happened this frame this male friend confirmed audrey's account on a phone call with her as an advisor audrey later told other friends what happened in may most of whom said something along the lines of well what do you expect you went back to his hotel room which again if you're if you're someone's friend and they went through something so traumatic at that time again there is a time and place to say these sort of things that isn't the time if you're that person you're a dickhead too you deserve to be pushed off a cliff um it continues audrey was studying for a levels at the time and recalls feeling extremely depressed following the assault i felt stupid and naive and all my illusions about the techno were shattered for years i have blamed myself for getting in a situation where i was in a hotel room with a man for his actions towards me to this day i still cannot listen to any of his music i feel sick when i see his name written on the poster of a track listing see see and whenever I do attend a gig, I have to make sure he's not on the lineup. Oh, yeah, yeah. First of all, it's not your fault. If ever this happens to you and you're 18 years old, it's never your fault, right? Um, I'm, again, I'm always going to put the responsibility in the adult. I think the adult should be the adult in that situation. And you shouldn't be getting to... If you need to drug somebody, allegedly, or get them drunk to the point of them passing out in the bed for you to get with them, they have no business being in your room. That's what I'm saying. If you can't get with somebody that's 18 that adores you, right? with them just being completely sober it's never going to happen you should be never trying to get with that person in the first place that's my opinion that matter in the first place right but it's never that person's fault it's always within the fault of the adult that's the responsibility where it lays into it my issue with this again is that it looks like a thing that's it's not an isolated incident we obviously had the eric Mueller story we had the other occasions of other people getting involved in some sort of issue there's definitely something about this in nightlife industry with high profile DJs where they sometimes feel a little bit untouchable. They sometimes feel as if the rules don't apply to them, where they feel like they can get away with absolute murder. And for some reason, again, my opinion, especially based on the Octavian thing, it's less about the individual, Eric Murillo, um, D Derek May at this point in time, allegedly, and other people as well have been accused in the past. And it's more so about the support system around them and an industry that protects them from any kind of retribution. Because if you're telling me that RA and DJ Mag are the first people to talk about this openly or to know what happened behind the scenes, I call bullshit. I think his agents knew. I think his label knew. Booking managers, people from different bars, and no one was willing to speak up. No one was willing to take a stand and say what needed to be said because they didn't want to risk retribution. They didn't want to put anyone out because they knew most likely than not if they call him out, Derek Mays, because I think if you're Derek May and you're a flipping dickhead and you're a sociopath, you're definitely going to be like, well, if, if you're talking about me, why not this guy? Why not him? Why not her? Because I'm sure it's rampant in the scene. And that's the issue. The support system lets these monsters get away with this nonsense. And the people that suffer are the victims. Are the victims, innocent victims, 18 years old. You're going to a gig. You're a baby, right? I can imagine what an 18 year old looked like in 2014. I bet you they don't look at those 18 year olds at, you know, in 2020. So any um defense you're gonna say about oh she looked like she was 22 though no that's a kid fair enough they come to the raid fair enough they you want to invite them to your room and give them a, an amazing time and let them know and let them you know convert them into being a fan for life like i said imagine if this went a good way and he signs a, an ep he takes amazing pictures with them he tells them stories he lets them get drunk on on his um mini fridge you know whatever and lets them sleep before they go home in the morning and you get some an uber in the morning and doesn't do anything just as a gentleman it's still weird right you shouldn't be invited to 18 years in room anyway but let's say he did that that way they're gonna be fans for his for life for life bro but he doesn't. He said he, he does the opposite way. And again, that's 2014. So they'd be what, 33 now? 34, 35? Come on, man. That's the annoying part. And again, look at the accounts. Look at the accounts. I'm not going to read all of them, but 2008 Amsterdam, 1999 in Toronto, 1999 20, 2000 in Wellington, New Zealand, I'm assuming, 2012 in Detroit, 2005 in London. Like, absolute disgusting. And again, 
some of the some of the things that have been going on online the response to this has been quite shocking for some reason i don't know why it is whenever these accusations come about facebook seems to be the worst place for the responses to read everyone's defending him on that page i don't know why it is why it happened to eric miller too all the people all the people that are defending him were always on facebook never on instagram well, facebook and instagram it felt like eric miller and some industry people too but for the most part the people on facebook seem to be very very um understanding of eric miller's or derek may's position oh like those girls are to blame why they go to his room first oh, you know the nightlife scene is i'm making excuses which is disgusting to say the least and again i'm saying categorically as a fan of nightlife as a promoter myself as a dj myself if you're in an event and you're doing anything that involves women, that involves, you know, uh, the female form, go out of your way to create a safe space. Go out of your way to make them feel comfortable because out there, there are absolute monsters and heathens that are doing exactly what this person's doing and making their life an absolute misery. And it's very, very distressing to read. And, I'm, and again, big up the ladies for coming out and kind of, you know, detailing their stories and raising the account in public. But God almighty, man, imagine, just imagine. Like absolutely insane, absolutely insane. So yeah, I'm interested to see how this develops. I don't know what the next stage is. Like, what do you are there kind of um, legal proceedings that can be brought against him? I don't know what you know. Again, maybe the, it's best that they spoke about it in the open and be able to kind of get that weight off their shoulders and kind of set themselves free from it in some way, shape, or form. But I don't know how he's going to be punished for this if he is found guilty. Um, regardless, I'm glad it's in the open so people can talk about it openly. And maybe this will kind of spurn some sort of reaction, some sort of change in the industry. With it, probably not. But Derek May's excuse or Derek May's reasoning behind it, calling himself, you know, starting it off with I'm a black man, just makes me sick to my stomach, really. But yeah, man, what an absolutely horrendous story. But I'd love to know your thoughts on that story. Let me know in the comments down below. What do you think? Do you think Derek May's been unfairly treated? Do you believe the accounts of the women? Do you think there is a problem with sexual harassment in nightlife or in dance music? Let me know in the comments down below. Okay, that has been what? That's what? Um, that is a uh, hour and 20, isn't it? That's uh, hour and 20. Maybe that's a good time, good place to flip in. Come to a screeching halt, hour and 20, maybe, isn't it? Should we come to a screeching halt there or should we continue? Duh, 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 duh. Yeah, let's come to a screeching halt there. Hour and 20 minutes. Let's come to a screeching halt. Hour and 20 minutes. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been amazing. Amazing to have your company. Thank you so much for your company. It's been amazing. We're on the 100, 400 show. You know, what can we do? We're here. We're chilling. We're doing the vibes. You know how it is. If it's the first time tuning in to show via YouTube, make sure you smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening for the podcast app, please give me a five-star review. Share the show with your friends. Or that malarkey. And if you're listening, or if you're listening by any other platform, just share it, it, share it, help out the show. Thank you again for the support. Number 400 in the books. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace.